If we want to find solutions to today's challenges and build bridges across divides, we need a deeper understanding of global issues. The Pulitzer Center supports journalists all over the world who report on topics like climate change, public health, migration, and more. We share that reporting through public events that engage wide audiences and lesson plans that inspire the next generation. Support journalism and education for the public good. Become a Pulitzer Center champion today. Hi, I'm Larry Price, a documentary photographer based in Dayton, Ohio, and I spent most of 2018 traveling to seven different countries reporting and photographing on the health effects of PM 2.5 pollution. PM 2.5, it, it is a massive uh, public health hazard uh, on a global scale, and the pollution itself kills seven million people a year. Everything from industry to carbon burning, automobile emissions, burning a lot of wood for fuel, coal-fired plants. All of these issues, many of them man-made, contribute to the huge rates of PM 2.5 in some global urban environments. India, for instance, a lot of burning of coal in, indoors, and they burned a lot of wood in Macedonia. Also in Chile, I saw that. They were poisoning themselves inside their own home, and that was a common theme that I came across in country after country. I had a portable PM 2.5 meter, and I was constantly taking readings. Cameras can be cleaned, you know, your, your health is something else. <laughs> I try to really dive into the subject's lives and I have empathy for them, and, and I try to establish that trust before anything else, before I ever start taking pictures. And I want to really experience what they're going through, you know, and I tell myself, hey, I can leave any time. You know, I can get on a plane tomorrow if I have to. They can't. So if they can do this, um, certainly I can do it if they're going to respect what I'm doing enough to let me into their lives. From the onset, I knew the Pulitzer Center was the perfect support for this because the team at the Pulitzer Center never failed to think big. It really was a groundbreaking project because we were really out in front of a lot of the reporting. And it was certainly the first project of its type to try to explain the health effects of PM 2.5 pollution on a global scale. The team that, that brought their talents to bear were just unparalleled. I mean, how they put together the graphics and all the data analysis and everything that went into it is just phenomenal. In North Macedonia, they were holding a series of elections while we were there. They were aware of this reporting. Uh, it certainly put the issue of PM 2.5 on the map. They had been talking about pollution in general, you know, and they and these groups were always challenged about trying to define pollution, that sort of thing. So they were able to use these reports, you know, to really try to make their case. The awards, it make, they make me feel great. I mean, it, it's validation. It's always nice to be recognized by your peers. Those things are all well and good, but, you know, I, I was just happy to follow through and see it produced and, and funded on such a, a wonderful scale, you know, where it could be impactful and make a difference. We've been reporting on the environment for generations, but what we're finally able to do these days is to gather precise data that correlates cause and effect and make the case to the powers that be that policies need to change. It's just all about awareness. It's about education. It's about putting information out there and really trying to get it in front of the right people, you know, that can make a difference. I mean, that's, that's, that's really what it's all about. Wonderful. Welcome everyone to this session on China's domestic and global environmental footprint. This is day two of Environment Redefined, the 2021 Pulitzer Center Conference. I'm Nora Moragalui from the Pulitzer Center and I hope you enjoy learning more from Larry Price about his work. As our audience is settling in, please let us know in the chat where you're listening from. And for those who haven't joined us before or might have missed the earlier video, the Pulitzer Center is a nonprofit journalism and education organization with the mission to elevate public engagement with underreported issues. We are based in Washington, DC, but our staff and our work are global. 
We support more than 170 reporting projects each year in collaboration with news outlets and journalists around the world, bringing together this work by themes on our website, and not only on the environment, but about racial justice, migration, public health, and more. And as you know, we don't stop with the reporting. Our education programming spans from elementary schools to graduate degree programs and outreach to the broader public. Environment Redefined is the Pulitzer Center's fourth annual conference. And in past years, we've explored the topics of gender, peace and conflict, and religion. Last year, in lieu of a conference which was canceled because of the pandemic, we hosted an online series focused on justice issues. We're very happy that you're all joining us this year for our very first fully virtual conference. And if you're inspired by what you hear today, please consider supporting our vital mission. A couple of logistical notes. We're gonna to begin today with a conversation among panelists and then aim to answer questions from the moderator and the public. Please add your questions anytime via the Q&A icon. Note that all attendees are muted, but if you cannot hear us, please feel free and let us know via the chat box. We are also recording this session to post online and live tweeting, and you can join the conversation with the hashtag environment redefined. And one final note, please stay online once this session ends to participate in a brief survey to help us strengthen programming in the future. Now I'd like to introduce our moderator for this session, Ning Hui, or Lulu, is a senior journalist, editor, and international desk lead with Initium Media, a Chinese media based in Hong Kong that specializes in in-depth reporting. Lulu is also a Pulitzer Center and Rainforest Journalism Fund grantee, having covered local indigenous communities' legal fight against Chinese mining companies in the Ecuadorian Amazon. Generally, Lulu focuses on China's many connections to the world beyond, and Lulu is based in Brussels. As you all know, today's additional esteemed panelists are Melissa Chan, Sean Gallagher, and Ian Johnson. They will share a bit about themselves soon. So with that, thank you so much, Lulu, for agreeing to moderate today's session. Thank you, Nora, for the kind introduction. Welcome, everyone, to today's panel. Um, 10, 20 years ago, a panel discussion on China environment will most likely focus on its domestic issues, seeing an economy grow rapidly and how that has an impact on China's environment and its communities. But today, Google China and environment probably will give you as many stories on China's global impact, resulting from the Belt and Road initiatives with Chinese investments and loans on energy and infrastructure projects across the globe especially the global south, as well as China's sizable international trade and mass consumption from raw materials to food. Also, global, China, global climate change talk where um, China plays an important role there. This is a huge subject and we have a very interesting panel today to have a conversation about it. Melissa, Sean, Ian are veteran journalists with long time experience in covering these issues from inside and outside China. We will start with questions that are related to our panelists' reporting project. I would like to start with Sean. So Sean, from more than 10 years ago, you've captured some of the most powerful images of deserts in Western China and how people's lives were impacted by desertification there. Would you like to share with us some of the, what you saw? I was also very intrigued by another more recent project of yours, which looks at exotic pet owner in China, something for the more urban and the middle class population, I suppose. Do you see a gap among the rural and urban populations in China regarding their understanding of human nature relationships, environment or climate change? Oh, and uh, would you like to introduce yourself a little, a little bit more before answering your question? Sure, thanks Lulu. Um, yes, uh, I'm a photographer and filmmaker and I've been uh, based here in Asia since 2006. Uh, I started my work on environmental issues really from the very beginning of my career and that's what has been the main focus of the majority of my work over the past 15 or 16 years. And the very first project that I really worked on on environmental issues here in Asia was looking at the issue of desertification in China. And I first learned about the issue in around 2005, before I even came to China. And I, I first started shooting the story in around 2008. And in 2009, I got a, my first grant from the Pulitzer Center, who uh, helped me 
fund a trip that took me from one side of China to the other. I traveled from, from Beijing in the east and I traveled overland through all of um, China's northern provinces, through Inner Mongolia, uh, Ningxia, Gansu, and into Xinjiang. And that trip, which took me around six weeks, was really my first experience of, of learning about the, the rural challenges that, that China faces it with regards to the environment. And with the issue of desertification, I was looking at issues about um, environmental refugees, degraded grasslands, uh, looking at abandoned cities and even sandstorms. So that trip really helped cement my interest in understanding what was happening within China. And then over the years, that has actually broadened into looking at China's influence uh, around Asia as well. Um, so the images that you're seeing on screen here are from that 2009 trip across China, looking at all the the different smaller challenges that each of these regions are facing with regards to desertification. And obviously that has now become an issue that's been in the news recently, as I'm sure many people uh, who are uh, listening probably saw in the news recently with the um, sandstorms that have returned to China, uh, returned to Beijing, sorry. For many years, um, Northern China had a big problem with sandstorms. They dissipated in recent years. So people really kind of forgot about them almost, but now this year they've really returned in a, a number of waves. And so that kind of provides that connection between these, these issues that start in the, the rural remote regions of, of China, but the urbanites are reminded of these issues really only in the, in the cases of when like a big event, like a, like a sandstorm. Um, so, I think the, we'll talk about this a little bit later, I think, the, the disconnect really between rural challenges and, and urban challenges is, is getting wider, I think, especially as China urbanizes even more. And my, my thinking about this, this disconnect uh, between people and the environment uh, really developed into this type of story, which you're seeing on screen now, which was looking at the exotic pet trade in China, which is which is uh, growing year on year. And that's really closely connected with the international wildlife trade. Um, most of which is funneled through places like Hong Kong into the mainland. And people in urban areas in China are now looking at exotic pets. The middle classes and, and upper classes are getting exotic pets as status symbols almost. But again, it, it the project aims to speak to really the relationship that people are having with uh, nature, with the environment, with the wildlife, and with the exotic pets in China story. That also touches upon the relationship that we're having in terms of uh, ecosystem and uh, forest exploitation, for example, where people are pushing further into these fragmented uh, habitats they're coming into closer contact with wildlife, uh, which also then leads on to things such as um, virus outbreaks, global virus outbreaks, uh, which is obviously something we're all very familiar with at the moment. So even though I cover these stories within China, I'm always looking to try to connect them to these larger issues that affect uh, both Asia and, and a, global, um, a global perspective. Thanks, John, for the very quick dive into the diversity of China and showing us the society's many sides. Um, I would like to ask the next question to Ian. From your experience covering China in the past decades, can you maybe tell us how environmental issues were raised and changed over time in China? I mean, how do different, different, different communities in China discuss and even mobilize to change things, especially when it becomes more clear that there are environmental consequences from this economic development, from water to air, from soil to forest? I mean, the environment is quite an interesting space, no, for the development of uh, civil society in China, wouldn't you say? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I was thinking, looking at Sean's pictures, and they reminded me uh, of, of a trip that I made through northwestern China in the 1990s. And um, I, I thought there's almost sort of three phases of how the environment's been 
treated in China. And back in the 90s, when I was working as a, as a journalist, um, people were aware of environmental issues and desertification and things like that. It was often pushed, these issues were, were promoted by the World Bank and China would, you know, the Chinese government would go out and plant uh, 40,000 or 100,000 trees to rebuild this great green wall and stop desertification or try to, a lot of this was sort of um, haphazard or just something that was done in order to uh, fulfill the requirements of a loan and many of the trees died a lot of it was sort of monocrop style planting um, where they would just plant all the same trees and then just die very easily and stuff like that you, you know people right on the on the borders were aware of it but there wasn't so much awareness in among the general population was my overall impression um, unless you were directly affected if a factory was pouring effluent into your irrigation canal and killing all your your plants I mean obviously then you were aware of it but I think overall there wasn't as much awareness and then I think there was this sort of flowering that we saw on a whole range of, uh, of, of fronts um, in the from the late 90s for kind of like a decade almost say from 2000 to 2010 when the internet was relatively new the party hadn't quite figured out how to control it um, there was a, a flourishing of non-governmental organizations, many of them with overseas ties. Uh, this was welcomed by many reformist elements in the party as well. And the environment was one of those sort of sweet spots where you weren't necessarily challenging the party. You could just say, the party at the top uh, wants to tackle environmental issues. It's just a few bad apples that are wrecking things to with this local village chief here whose brother-in-law runs the local factory that's polluting things. And you could maybe file a lawsuit. There were class action lawsuits that were allowed back then. And you could uh, challenge that, but not, not try to overthrow the system or anything like that, but it was seen as in line with uh, government priorities. And this was amplified through social media, especially Weibo, which was um, like Twitter in that you don't have to accept people. You can just follow other people randomly. You don't have to um, accept them as friends, unlike say Facebook. And so it's Weibo and through these uh, other social media platforms, but especially Weibo, um, this really amplified this. And, and, and journalists, Chinese journalists were doing uh, excellent work and able to uh, affect some sort of change. Now this, Obviously, um, starting, I, I don't like to say it started with Xi Jinping, that's too simplistic. It started really before that, but um, sort of taking effect, especially in the 2010s, uh, this forum was um, kneecapped, essentially. And they uh, got rid of, I mean, Weibo was essentially made irrelevant for as, as a public platform for discussion. Uh, people who were able to you know, ampl amplify voices were uh, forced off and NGOs had a harder and harder time. They could no longer, there was an NGO law that was passed, I think it was in 2016, and this made it impossible or you're not supposed to take any foreign funding, have any sort of foreign uh, workshops, training, capacity building and that sort of thing. Um, and that, that really, I think, hurt the ability of Chinese environmental NGOs to make an impact. I think this was part of an overall view of, of a tightening of control over society, this idea that things had maybe gotten out of control a little bit in the 90s and, and 2000s, and the party had to reassert um, control. And, but this didn't mean that the environment would be completely um, swept under the, the, the carpet, but it was that the party would take care of it. The party, you know, if you had some loyal criticism, that was okay, but the party would handle it. And so you did see some interesting things like the publishing of PM 2.5 statistics. Initially, this was considered interference in China's internal affairs when the US embassy published uh, PM 2.5 readings on Twitter. Um, but after a while, um, around I think 2012 or 2013, China began uh, releasing uh, PM 2.5 statistics for uh, scores of cities across China. And there was an app that was developed that you could get, you could access in Chinese app stores and so on. And so you can see the environment is still um, a national issue. It's still a priority, but it's going to be handled in a much more controlled fashion. And I think that that um, 
is still where we are today, uh, that these groups that were much more active 10, 15 years ago, like Friends of Nature, they har hardly exist or just exist in a very curtailed uh, fashion. The idea of being able to set up chapters nationwide, that's been a complete non-starter for a decade. And so the government is still interested in this issue. It realizes that it's also an opportunity to develop new industries, but it wants to guide it. And it wants to, and this is the same in a, in a whole range of fields, for example, religion or, or other things like that, that it wants the sort of go-go years of civic participation, civic participation to be to, to end and for the government to have a guiding role. And so I think that's where we are now. Maybe that's a good place to stop. Yeah, thanks, Ian. Now, we talked about how um, uh, raising awareness on environmental issues inside China, and there is this systemic limitation, basically, in engaging civil society to address them. But I think what's interesting is that when Chinese companies start to invest abroad in mass infrastructure and energy projects, they actually have to often have to face these democratic institutions, NGOs, local communities protesting, and environmental lawyers and activists, all these things. My next question is for Melissa. From your reporting on Chinese invested projects in Brazil, could you tell us how these projects impact local communities and what kind of resistance these Chinese companies may be facing there? which might be very different from how things are from inside China, right? Yeah, absolutely. And before I answer the question, I just want to say that I, re I remember, I believe, Sean, the first time I ever met you was at uh, a gallery uh, exhibition of yours um, looking at the environment uh, and the environmental issues in China. So it's, it's really nice to be able to um, listen to what you have to say and share some of the more recent work uh, you've done. Uh, yeah, so uh, I was uh, in Brazil in the Amazon jungle and, um, and also just backtrack. I used to, of course, then you can infer that I used to be based in Beijing for a number of years as a China correspondent. Um, but hello from Berlin, where I am these days working on a lot of different kinds of stories and one of them being China's impact beyond its borders. And I had the opportunity through the Pulitzer Center to go to Brazil and look at the Amazon jungle and the deforestation that was taking place there. Uh, for your first question, Lulu, um, I think that's one of the really interesting things. Um, I'm making a generalization here, but I just say the first generation or the earliest generation of Chinese companies that went abroad often um, went to so many different places as some of these places had corrupt governments and they would um, sort of uh, have closed door uh, deals with governments or government organizations to build out their Belt and Road uh, various projects. And, um, you know, uh, there's there are cases of corruption in, in, in different countries. And um, sometimes the Chinese uh, company might participate in that to grease the wheel. Sometimes they wouldn't. Um, but uh, there was recognition that you went to those in power to cut the deal. And um, I think that there was a misunderstanding that those in power had all of the power. And in the cases you alluded to in Latin America, there's a strong history of, of civil society and progressive activism there, right? So even in places where the governments uh, seem to have a lot of control, that there is a lot of corruption and corruption is what is kind of needed to make things happen. Uh, there, there are very significant uh, opposition groups and people that can really kind of um, put a stop to projects or certainly make them difficult, as you know, if you were, of course, in Ecuador and know about the hydroelectric project and some of the Ecuadorian activists, including Martha Roldos, right? Um, and um, I do think the, where we are now is different, that um, there have been lessons learned and there's a lot more corporate social, uh, corporate responsibility uh, in Latin America what, for Chinese companies and um, that things are, are different. Uh, but I, I do think that uh, it's kind of funny that in some ways they didn't understand that because certainly uh, there were connections between the Communist Party and like communist parties in Latin America that where you, you think that there'd be some understanding of how things happened um, uh, and how things operated on the ground. I mean, the other example of course is Berta Cáceres of Honduras, the Goldman um, Prize environmentalist uh, who was who's murdered and uh, um, you know the project that she was looking at and she was opposing 
was a local project, but also had a connection to, I think, a Chinese partner. Um, so, so you see a lot of this. Okay, so then the second half of your question is a little bit more specific to my, my project. Um, and I think it's important. Uh, so, so deforestation in Brazil in the Amazon is driven by two main things. Um, the, the soy production, um, so uh, agriculture, and uh, beef production, uh, cattle pasturing and grazing. Uh, and beef and soy, the largest uh, buyer, uh, you know, the biggest place that uh, Brazil exports to is China. So China is, is, is connected and drives that deforestation, you can say. Um, on the other hand, though, you have these traders uh, who, who are involved in the purchase of soy, particularly um, in the global commodities market. And these are not necessarily Chinese companies. They're Brazilian multinationals, they're American multinationals. So I think it's really tricky. Um, and something that, you know, uh, the crux of a lot of my uh, pieces was looking at the China impact because I think it's something that people should, should look at. Uh, but in every article almost um, mentioned was the fact that you have these Brazilian and American companies uh, as well. Uh, and the fairly new entrant in all of this in terms of Chinese companies is Kotco, right? The uh, multinational uh, or international grain company um, that's Chinese, um, but um, compared to Cargill and, and the others, it's actually uh, still kind of up and coming as a presence in Brazil. Having said that, um, Kotco's largest group of employees outside of China is in Brazil. So it says something about the importance of Brazil uh, for China's food security strategy. Um, and, uh, and in terms of, uh, you know, I talked about civil society. One of the activists I remember um, speaking to, what really struck me in terms of the difference uh, when it comes to opposing uh, uh, something related to China and Latin America, as opposed to like an American mining company or something is that they, even though um, Ian alluded to this, like a fair, there's a fairly robust domestic in China um, group of um, activists and civil society on the environment. Um, it's still not a, a, as much as say the United States states. So for example, if a US company was in a Latin American country doing something that people locally opposed, um, you had the local environment, environmentalists who could liaise with their North American activists and American activists could show up at the American company's headquarters and pick it outside. And so they can do this kind of coordination. And one of the things that really struck me is the uh, one of the activists in Latin America said, we don't have that kind of leverage when it comes to Chinese companies. I mean, uh, you know, there might be language barrier, but I also do think that it is also like in terms of the activism, it's much more dangerous to appear outside in China to, to protest or, or to, um, you know, and, and then you potentially as an activist in China, environmental activists be accused of colluding with foreign forces if you're working with uh, foreign activists. So th there is that difference. And um, and just to, to go back uh, further with one of your questions, of course, you also have indigenous groups um, in the Amazon. Um, and um, I think that is something that a lot of Chinese companies are, unfam are unfamiliar with or were unfamiliar with and, and then starting to learn. And, and they are a very important uh, component. They have a say in things uh, in the Amazon. Uh, it's in the Brazilian constitution. Um, and so that is definitely a factor uh, that you have to think about when, for example, uh, a Chinese company is thinking whether they want to invest in a railroad in the Amazon jungle, which is what we're, we were looking at, is the possibility of building a railroad in order to move the soy to the coasts, uh, put them onto boats heading for China, um, that you have these indigenous groups who, uh, you know, leaders who, are who would tell me, uh, you know, we will stop this uh, infrastructure project from uh, happening. We want to stop this railway project because anytime you build out infrastructure, when it comes to transportation, um, it comes, uh, what follows is development. Um, development is good for some people, but not for people who value uh, their environment um, and, and their indigenous territories. Super interesting. Super interesting. Thank you, Melissa. I think I share some of your experiences as well. And I do think over time that non-technical risks um, are becoming more obvious so for a lot of investors uh, in China and hopefully will lead to some meaningful discursive and policy changes. I don't know, could take some time. Okay, my following questions are for all three of you. The very first one is, 
Um, are we paying extra attention to China's global environmental um, footprint compared to other economies? I mean, uh, should we pay extra attention? As Melissa earlier was saying, you know, there are many, there's a whole global economic change behind it. Um, Sean, would you like to start with this question? Sure. Well, I think it's uh, impossible to view, you know, the majority of these environmental issues just from the China perspective, because, you know, China exists in this ecosystem now of, of influence, uh, which stretches not just with its neighbours, but all over the world. And I think we're especially seeing that in terms of projects like the Belt and Road Initiative, where countries are becoming so closely uh, intertwined with uh, China's um, both environmental policies and, and other types of policies. So I think it's, I think every environmental issue within China has to be viewed in, in terms of the impacts that it has on other, other countries. And for, for me and from my reporting, uh, a little bit similar to Melissa's recent reporting, uh, I traveled to Cambodia at the beginning of last year, just, just before the pandemic uh, really broke out. And, and did a project with the Bullet Center looking at um, deforestation in Cambodia. And in Cambodia, the, the two main causes of, of deforestation are linked to um, firstly, the poaching of very high value uh, rosewood. Uh, that rosewood is, uh, it's poached from the forests of Cambodia, smuggled into Vietnam, where it's then shipped to Hong Kong. And then it makes its way to the, uh, the Chinese mainland where the rosewood is converted into extremely high value furniture. Um, so that, that occurs in one instance in the forests, but the major cause of deforestation in Cambodia is linked to the clearance of forests for agriculture. And uh, the agricultural plantations uh, in Cambodia are now um, replacing the forests all over the country. And they're producing uh, crops such as uh, rubber, cassava, banana, cashew nuts. And all of these are being exported to countries around Southeast Asia, but also to um, China. And China and Cambodia, for example, are developing even closer links. Recently, they recently had a new free trade agreement and Cambodia has over a billion dollars of, of trade going to, to China. So they have a very deep connection now to China, as do many other countries in the region. So the demand of these products from countries like Cambodia, whether it's rosewood or whether it's from the agricultural products that, that uh, Cambodia produces, um, they're, they're inextricably linked. Um, so we have to view these issues in terms of you know, the demands coming from China, but also how they affect other countries in, in the region as well. And, and that also applies to things such as, as water. Um, one of my earlier projects that I did with the Pulitzer Center in, in 2012 was looking at climate change impacts on the Tibetan Plateau. And I spent about a month um, on the Tibetan Plateau looking at the effects of the drying out of the grasslands, how many of the Tibetan people are being relocated into um, uh, into camps and permanent residences on the plateau and looking at the effects of um, the dams that are being built there. And, and that's another issue that is really key to, to Asia uh, as a whole, because obviously many of the, the main rivers that feed uh, water to countries throughout South and Southeast Asia, they all originate in, uh, in China on the Tibetan plateau. So China has this, this uh, control this hold on the water that um, really the, the majority of Asia relies upon. Um, so whatever ch decisions China makes uh, with regards to say water, uh, this is going to affect many countries across the region and, and affect billions of people. And so it's, you, we really have to view these issues in terms of how they are affecting both China and its surrounding countries, but also the, the relationships on a political level that China has with its neighbors, because that will be incredibly important in terms of resource management. And you know, if there is a falling out between China and a, a neighboring country over one issue, it may affect 
an issue such as water supply or the the international trade that exists between those two countries. So I think we have to pay attention to the the uh, the effects that that China's demands have on other countries. Yeah. Seeing your picture, it makes me think it's not like we're putting China in the center spot. It is we're putting nature in it. And then eventually we're all sort of, you know, being implied by changes there. Um, Ian, what do you have? Uh, what do you think? Are we paying too much attention in China? <laughs> uh, well, I, I, of course, one doesn't want to be hypocritical and, and start paying so much attention to China without noting what all these other Western companies have done and there's a certain degree of hypocrisy when people all go oh gosh China's doing all this terrible stuff it's, it's sort of the same with carbon emissions when you outsource a lot of your production to China and then that allows you to sort of take this position that our carbon emissions are going down but China's are going up well it's, but we're buying a lot of that stuff so there has to be some sort of um, a view of this in a more holistic way uh, that said, I think it's not. I, I think it is justified to look at China closely because we've seen w the way the government's development strategy has been at, at home in China has been to develop first and clean up later, and this has created um, it's, it's a disaster when it comes to soil quality, water quality, air quality across the board. Um, and, and, and that this will be then maybe exported again as China sort of does the same thing, right? And exports its dirty industries to other places, but maybe without the NGO oversights that Melissa was referring to. I think it, it's really it is legitimate to look at these things very closely. So I would just leave it at that. Melissa, what do you think? I think it's great that Ian said what he said because um, I, I can piggyback off of what he said um, in, in terms of um, it absolutely is super, there is a level of hypocrisy. You know, Europe where I am, the forests are all gone because uh, people here have essentially deforested over a millennium, a millennium. And of course the United States, you know, I talk about uh, Chinese consumption of beef, but per capita, Americans still uh, consume a, a lot of beef. Um, I do think that it is um, unfortunate uh, for China and, and India and other developing countries um, where they are sort of in this very interesting um, productive time um, in terms of their development. And uh, suddenly you have people walking in and saying, well, we need an international climate accord, you know, climate change, and you need to develop, but you need to develop sustainably. And uh, I can totally imagine somebody in China or India thinking, well, you know, like it's nice of you guys to try to control our, our development and our consumption when you guys didn't have to do it. Um, I want to be a little philosophical and, and say, well, you know, that unfortunately, you know, planet Earth is not keeping tabs on what is fair and what is not. Uh, and um, and uh, the analogy I like to give is okay, my neighbor murdered someone, does that give me a get out of uh, jail free you know, uh, car to murder somebody else, right? I mean, because the United States did this, because Europe did this, um, does that mean that China is allowed to do the same thing? I mean, I suppose if you want it to be fair, yes, uh, but we won't have a planet if we allow this to happen. So I think it's an unfortunate circumstance of timing that uh, we just need to deal with the climate emergency we have, and it will mean paying attention uh, to to China and its emissions as much as um, uh, you know developed countries' emissions. Um, and um, you know, I, I think also there might be a something I was thinking about is there might actually be more. And I'd be curious what the other panelists think. Focus on um, what China can do for the environment because. Uh, in some ways, it's an authoritarian country. I mean, look what they did with COVID, you know, and Wuhan, you know, close the city down, close everything down, and, you know, essentially get, ri get rid of um, a COVID <laughs> in China in a way that uh, many other places have not been able to. And so, like, we have all lived in Beijing. We've seen when they've decided, the officials, that we need clean air days for a political event or for the Olympics. And, like, lo and behold, shut down all the factories, air clears up. Like, so, um, you know, when you are an authoritarian state, you can make decision and, and override any uh, opposition to sort of 
um, get your way. And so maybe I really wonder whether like there is a lot of focus because there's a belief while well, the leadership can make decisions and then, um, you know, things will happen. As Sean knows, it's not that simple. And as Ulu knows, it's a lot more complicated than that on the provincial level. Uh, and even the county level, things get tricky. But uh, I, I do wonder whether there's a perception that China can just like pivot and make these decisions at the international level where people pay so much attention to it. Thanks, Melissa. Um, okay, I think that leads to that, that, that discussion leads to the next question very well, which is that um, how China is portrayed and what is the opinion about China? I mean, you guys report on China story to a more global audience, if such audience exists. Um, do you feel that there's a very divided opinion about China's uh, rising influence and have that changing opinion in the recent years somehow affected your reporting, maybe? Or maybe haven't. Um, Ian? Well, no, I, I think, like Melissa said, um, there is this perception that because China is an authoritarian state, they can do whatever they want. Um, and in terms of the environment, I, I once I did a, a long article on Handan, this uh, city in, in Hebei province, which at the time was the most polluted city in China. It's probably lost the mantle to, you know, Xintai or some other city nearby or something like that. But they had uh, often, uh, well, their average PM 2.5 reading, I think overall was something like 150. Um, and I think the, the UN said the recommended highest level was, is 10 or something like that. So they were regularly 15 times. So, you know, you could sort of say, gee, they should be able to do something about that. But when you get down to the grassroots and you see how things work, uh, the local officials have a lot of pressure. They had this steel work that I went and visited, Han Steel. They had this super modern thing that employed like 2,000 people. And then they had this dirty part of the factory, which employed 20,000 people. And it wasn't really profitable. And it didn't produce that much good stuff that was really necessary. But if you closed it down, you'd have 20,000 unemployed people. And they, the local officials had to sort of weigh this. And so, you know, this, some of the similar pressures that you get um, in, in other countries exist in China in, in, in political issues, trade-offs and stuff like that. Uh, and these are also, it's very similar in some ways. You can see uh, these kind of jobs that people want to get rid of in steel, the coking mills and all that. Yeah, they're really dirty and, and it hits the life expectancy of the people who work there, but they um, are, are well-paying jobs with good benefits and, and, and kind of like, we can see this nostalgia in, in the people who voted, say, for Trump, um, say, 40, you know, four years ago, that in China, you also have people who rue the loss of this. And so I think that complexity is sometimes missed by international audiences, which tend to have this monolithic view. Um, I'm in Singapore right now. There are many people who have a very positive view of, of China and think that it's, you know, it's, it's a relatively a success story and um, run by a meritocracy and so on and so forth. And then other people who are really worried about it, but it does tend to be this black and white view of the country. And I always think that must be our failing as journalists that we haven't gotten through all of the hues of gray that need to come through. But, you know, maybe that's just in the, that's perhaps just the way it is when you're dealing with big countries. I think people's views of the United States are often like that also overseas. When you're talking about big, powerful countries, people tend to see it as either, you know, black or white, so. Yeah. But Sean, with your medium photos, you know, sometimes it gives so much more um, details and human side to the story. Do, do you feel that your, your journalistic approach would change the narrative at some places or is still sometimes the black and white um, division falls on you too? Well, I think my narrative approach has changed over the years, but that's been really through my internal uh, processes rather than any external uh, pressures. Uh, but the longer I've spent here in Asia and in China, the more I've wanted to try to show and, and tell more personal stories about Chinese people, about communities who are really being affected by some of these bigger issues that we're talking about, whether it's the biggest of all climate change, you know, biodiversity loss, or some of the, uh, the, the smaller issues. So like the series that we just saw about the exotic pets. I mean, that came from 
really trying to humanize a story, but and, and at the same time connect it to these wider issues that are affecting um, not just Asia, but you know, these global wildlife trade for, the, for that story in particular. And also um, in recent years, I've moved into filmmaking as well. And obviously filmmaking is very much focused on um, the storytelling of, of characters and, and of people's stories. So that's definitely something that I've really introduced into my work. And a few years ago, I, I worked on a, a short documentary with The Guardian looking at um, the um, one conservationist here in Beijing who's, who's trying to protect birds and stop bird poaching, for example. And he was really a, like a lone wolf character who was out in Beijing trying to single-handedly stop this that trade which uh, which takes place here. Uh, but yes, it's a personal story, but I think it's also important, touching on what um, Melissa and Ian just talked about, is that it can't all just be about a top-down approach to solving many of these problems. There has to be enthusiasm from, from normal Chinese people to, to get involved, to be behind some of these, these policies that are rolled out to protect the environment. And I think if that can be done, if the sweeping, um, sweeping laws or legislation that come in to tackle some of the bigger problems can be combined with the, with the power and the ingenuity and the, and the enthusiasm that people can have for protecting the environment here, then, then I think uh, things would really change quickly. Right. And for you, Melissa, you probably feel this quite a bit. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think your question was about um, the divided opinions about China. And, and I, I, I do agree with what Ian said, is that it does seem like people like it black and white. Um, I, I want to give the example of World Wildlife Foundation, or is it World Wildlife Fund? Um, WWF in China uh, last year came out with a video explaining China's relationship to deforestation in the Amazon. I mean, it was almost like my article and, and this, this WWF China video like matched. Um, and uh, I, I was super interested in this fact. Um, and uh, they put out this video and it got pulled and censored. Like there was a massive backlash. A lot of people in China saying, you know, why, are, why is WWF China blaming Chinese people for consuming beef? Look at the Americans and like, Blah, blah, blah. So I do think that the black and white is not just um, from outside looking at China. I think the, the reality is let's have some political context here. And it's not as simple as when Xi Jinping became leader, but um, it is you know, true that in the last, this most recent generation, last decade, uh, there's just been more nationalism in, 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 in China because of the, the propaganda and because of the fruits of um, patriotic education that was rolled out in the, in the 90s sort of coming to head as people become adults. And so um, there is a defensiveness when there is criticism about China's environmental uh, role in the world um, from, from some quarters. And it's not a minority quarter, I would say. I would say it's the majority that is, is quite nationalistic. And that contributes also to the divided China and the black and white. Because here you have an example of a Chinese NGO that was trying to spread a message, educate people about personal responsibility and choice um, about whether you want to consume meat um, and, and kind of knowing where your food comes from um, and having this backlash where it was uh, censored. Yeah, almost sounds like a vicious circle. The more black, white you, black and white you get, the more resistance you get from the Chinese population and the more that gets difficult to tackle. I mean, this goes to my next question, really. Um, I mean, we talked about uh, how environmental issues are slowly being raised and understood more in domestic China, right? And how China's economic drives impact other parts of the world. And these two things, and you guys talked about it. Do you see a, actually, I mean, we can talk a bit more. Do you see a barrier and a missed, uh, a missing connection between these two very different narratives? I mean, it's one narrative, but somehow it's pulled apart. I mean, uh, Melissa talked about these people are, in China are quite sensitive when it comes to how the rest of the world sees the country. But are Chinese audiences constructively engaged when we are talking about China's global environmental impact? And I mean, shouldn't, shouldn't we do that more or could we not do it actually? 
Um, how is it from your experience? Um, and maybe whoever wants to start. <laughs> okay, Ian, you're laughing. Okay, well, I, mean, I could just say, <laughs> to say I, I, I think that probably the, the issue is that there's a, lot, a, a lack of awareness among a lot of people in China. So like most was saying, you, know, you have this effort, this campaign and it's pulled. And um, I guess they, it probably even wasn't you know, that harshly critical. It was probably done in a way that was trying to be as constructive as possible. It was done for domestic consumption with all within the back of your mind, knowing what the, what the no-go areas would be and so on and so forth. And even that wasn't allowed. So I think there is sort of a, a lack of understanding. I, I think the, you know, the, the thing that probably impacts most people, if I think back to visiting Handan and, and the, the steel workers, there's one steel worker I really hung out with a lot and he had an organic uh, vegetable um, uh, it's like like club that he and he uh, uh, rented out land to other people and they all went up on this little plateau over the city and grew organic plants and uh, brought their kids up there to play and stuff. so there was this real awareness that the vegetables are the normal vegetables that you buy in the market are not safe and clean and so on and so forth they were trying to do something different it was you know you could say it was selfish in the way that they were just trying to uh, take care of their family and stuff like that. But that's how probably most changes happen in the world anyway, are by people acting out of self-interest. Um, I think the, the, the pity of it is that you just can't link people up and just get them a little more, uh, it does, you know, act, active and in, in, in just even in a very constructive way because of the limits on civil society are so great now that um, you just can't get, it's hard to raise people's conscience, uh, consciousness. So uh, I'm, I, th I think it's, um, it is a difficult situation to, to improve it right now like that. Mm -hmm. yeah, the, that answers your question. Yeah, inside China and outside China, about China seem to be completely <laughs> heading different ways. Can I quickly just say something to that? I mean, part of the problem is also uh, technology, the fact that technology is decoupling. So like in the United States and many in Europe, people use Twitter and Facebook. Those are banned in China uh, for political reasons, right? And so um, that decoupling is, has, has overall been uh, not good in terms of allowing Americans and, and Chinese citizens to engage with each other, probably on the you know, uh, lingua franca of the English language, but nevertheless, um, you know, having this kind of decoupling uh, just prevents people from being able to connect as easily. Right. And John, from your experience? Well, you know, I don't think you can blame the average Chinese person because the average person can only know what information they've been fed or have had access to and you know obviously the news is very tightly controlled within China whether that's the Chinese media uh, within China or whether that's international media just just access to to reliable accurate uh, information is just not a reality for the majority of, of people in China so it's um it's very difficult to, to blame the average Chinese person for not maybe caring about a certain issue or not being able to you know, take part in um, you know, civil activities that might be uh, aimed at improving the environment when they're really not, they don't have all the facts and not all the, all the, the information that maybe other people do. Yeah, I wish really we could have more stories that looks at the issues instead of instead of questioning the intention. Like you're not talking about Amazon, you're talking about why are you talking about Amazon? You know that kind of, that kind of stories. Are like I miss, I really want more. Which is my last question before we take in more audience um, questions. Um, if you were to give some advice and tips to fellow journalists um, or anyone interested in China and China's environmental footprint, what would you say? Where could journalists do better and more in this field, um, given all the challenges we've raised? Any ideas, <laughs> thoughts, tips? Well, I did see in the Q&A uh, that somebody had a question that kind of is, is the question you asked, but um, about like covering China's environmental impact uh, overseas. I just want to say that in some ways it, it might be easier than reporting inside China. So like if you're looking at a project like in Brazil, like we did, but or in Southeast Asia, 
you know, your ability to interview people who are working on a construction site or uh, on a farm might, might actually be easier than, than trying to access information in China. So I, I do think there's actually real value and merit to, to reporting in, in this way. Um, so that's my contribution. I'm just watching the time so I know we have limited time. Okay. Okay, we have to get some advice from you guys. Well, I, I guess the thing that I, I, I think is a pity is that there are, we need more people Sorry, Sean, in yeah. China. We... Sorry? No, I was just gonna say, I think we need more people in China um, reporting on, on China. Uh, this is of course after these expulsions last year, a number of people were expelled and, and there's been expulsions previous to that, <laughs> we all know. Um, but um, I, I think that there is there is information that you can get in China. Like I was sort of surprised a few years ago, I did something on the impact of the Winter Olympics in Beijing that's gonna be held next year. And a lot of people are looking at it from the perspective of, of Xinjiang and should people go there or not. Uh, but the, the environmental impact is absolutely catastrophic that this is basically a desert north of Beijing. There is no snow that's, that, that falls there naturally. And, and you know, if you dig around a little bit without too much sleuthing, you can find a lot of reports done by Chinese uh, researchers on this, on the amount of water that's used, um, the reservoirs that are having to be diverted for artificial snow, the amount of snow you need for these mountains and so on and so forth. And so I think that if you get in when you get into China and start looking around, you'll find that there's a lot of information out there. It's not always, it's not going to be on social media in China. You won't find it on, on WeChat because those things probably will not be, you know, will be censored pretty quickly. But I think that once you get talking to Chinese researchers and, and, and journalists and people who've worked on it, there's an incredible amount of, of knowledge and expertise in country. Um, and it's just a matter of going there and kind of digging it out. Um, so I, I think it's not ho hopeless. I don't think, uh, especially on something like this, I think you can, but it's important to be there, I think, to, to be in China as, as much as possible. I know that's not easy right now, like getting a visa to China or getting to going through COVID protocols and stuff like that. But assuming one day the pandemic is over and we can go back, you know, like that. That's, uh, yeah, so. John? Oh. Well, I would say um, be wary of China experts, quote unquote. Um, I think because there are so many and it's, it's kind of like um, wanting to learn about science, but just getting all your information from a physicist uh, yeah. who, who can tell you about physics, but they can't tell you about biology and chemistry. And even if they're, they're a physicist, they might have one specialty within physics. And it's kind of the same with China because China is so diverse that you have to be careful where you get your information, where you get your opinions from. So I think for um, journalists who are interested in reporting on China is to be aware of that. And of course, China is constantly changing. Someone who perhaps understood the way China was 10 years ago would find quite a different China now. And the pace in which different regions of China are, are changing uh, happens all the time. So I think uh, be very, um, wary of the experts you source the information from, but also, you know, make sure you're abreast of the diverse range of opinions um, who are talking about China, whether that's from within China or whether they're outside of China. That's nicely put. Okay, I think we can do very quickly a few questions from the audience. One um, that's in the Q&A box, I thought it's very um, interesting which is if you were to give advice um, for the Chinese uh, um, government uh, on the climate justice issue, what, will you, what would be your top three priorities area that China should really put its attention on? Um, what do you guys think? Melissa, do you have an idea of the? Uh, I, I would ask the policymakers to uh, ask questions about their investment in coal. Um, because um, the plants that they're building um, can really, based on the technology, would imply that they would be in operation for decades to come. And um, that doesn't really align with the, the commitment um, and the targets. And um, so I think that there is, you know, going back to the authoritarian country is just monolithic. It's not. Um, there's clearly tension between that and it really needs to be sorted 
um, I think, of course, uh, against uh, the more production and go of and and coal plants going online. So that's one of the three things. Okay, if we each give one, that would be three. <laughs> what is your top policy area, Ian, for China's climate policy? Uh, well, maybe this will be predictable, but I mean, I would say if we could somehow, if the authorities would trust and, and rely on society a bit more and not try to do everything themselves by unshackling the NGOs a bit more, allowing them to do a bit more, having allowing Chinese reporters who are just absolutely excellent to do some more reporting on this. And this could be in the sense of, you know, what used to happen 20 years ago is you had stuff that was more like loyal opposition, right? It wasn't people going to overthrow the Communist Party. They were just trying to put a spotlight on a legitimate issue of national importance. And that is just really hard to do now in China. And I think if you could, if that could be restored, I think there would be a lot of positive outcomes. So that would be nice. And Sean, for you? Well, I, I think I agree with uh, Ian and Melissa that, you know, it touches a little bit about what I, I mentioned earlier about unleashing the, the potential of civil society, like Ian mentioned, um, the, the everyday people to get involved in, in these issues, to have more of a voice and to release the, you know, the ingenuity and the, the passion and enthusiasm that people could have um, to contribute to solving many of these problems. Great, thank you. I'm told that I should really wrap it up. Um, sorry for the other questions that wasn't answered just yet. We'll probably be in touch and see what we can answer afterwards. And this is the end of our conversation. Thank you so much. It's really fruitful for me. And thanks everyone for joining us. I know Nora will have a few final notes to say about the conference and the center. Yes, thank you so, so much to all of the panelists, to Lulu and to Sean, Melissa and Ian for your amazing contributions today. For me as someone who is definitely not an expert as Sean alluded to, um, this has been enlightening and has given me a lot of ideas for what kind of reporting I'd like to read more of and hopefully we can continue these conversations in the future. Um, and yes, to those who submitted questions, um, we can try and facilitate contact afterwards. Um, I want to also thank my colleagues who are at the Pulitzer Center, especially Holly and Kayla, who have helped to produce today's session and organize this conference. Um, and of course, you all, the audience, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, if you're able, please remember that we are a nonprofit organization and we rely on donor um, support. So please donate today and become a Pulitzer Center champion at any level to gain exclusive benefits as part of our spring campaign, if you're able. And please check out pulitzercenter.org slash events to see additional panels and events during our Environment Redefined Conference. Our next event is going to be a conversation with Francis Seymour of the World Resources Institute and C4, also featuring Rainforest Investigations Network fellow Madeleine Guenga and myself at 10.30 a.m. Eastern time today. Please stay with us for just a few minutes longer to take a brief survey after we officially end today's session. And thank you again so much to our presenters and audience for joining. We really hope to see you at other sessions later this week. Thank you. Bye.